Hello everyone and welcome to this afternoon's session for the Australian, Australian Biocommons Showcase. This afternoon we'll be talking about how Galaxy Australia has been assembling reference genomes for Australian species. Uh, we'll be doing that through a series of short presentations and followed by a question and answer session. My name's Nigel Ward, I'm Associate Director for Software Platforms in the Australian Biocommons. I'll be convening this session, but fortunately you won't be hearing too much from me. You'll be hearing from a bunch of awesome speakers. But before I introduce those speakers, I do just want to acknowledge uh, the country which I'm presenting today, uh, acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which I'm pre presenting from today. Um, I'm in Brisbane slash Meijin. Uh, the traditional owners are the Turbal and Yagara people. I pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. I recognise the valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Uh, as I said, we'll be, you'll be hearing from a bunch of people today. Uh, I'll shortly hand over to Gareth Price, who's based at QCEF Bioinformatics and is the service manager for Galaxy Australia. He'll be talking about the end-to-end -end process that we'll be discussing today, really moving from data acquisition through to genome assembly and then subsequent analysis. Anna Sine, who's a bioinformatician at Melbourne Bioinformatics, will be talking to us about why scientists want to assemble large genomes and the challenges large genomes present in assembly. We'll be then hearing from Joe Day, who's a scientist at Taronga Zoo, about the genetic techniques she's been using to study the endangered regent honey eater. Following that, Sarah Richmond from Bioplatforms Australia will be talking about um, the various Bioplatforms projects that are sequencing uh, complex genomes, what's coming down the pipeline. And finally, Gareth will tell us about how Galaxy Australia has really been responding to all of those needs that the other presenters have been uh, talking about. And at the end, we'll have time for some question and answers. So over to you, Gareth. Thank you, Nigel, and thank you for the opportunity. So I wanted to just set the scene for our genome assemblies. And I guess I consider this an, an iterative process. And for whatever reason, I put the most important person in the bottom right hand corner. And that's really the person we're doing all this work for the researcher, the scientist, the ecologist, the environmentalist, and the on and on that we want to enable. Their process uh, through really industrialization and scaling up of sequencing means generating data and the example given here through AGRF is, is a seamless and relatively easy process to generate a lot of data. And then the real questions we know are where researchers uh, engage with their data. The first one is, I've got a lot of data, where can I keep it uh, for longevity and where can I keep it for reanalysis by myself or others in the future? And, that's where the Bioplatforms Australia data portal comes in. And up here on the top left, I've really uh, highlighted the, the Threatened Species Initiative because of the, the speakers we have today. And the end-to-end -end journey that we're building is then trying to couple uh, the generation of data, the, the deposition of data with the analysis of data. And in that sense, Galaxy Australia is our nominated platform where the researcher can really uh, go from requesting their data, hosting it, uh, analyzing it and back and on and on through iterative rounds of either uh, data generation and refinement or exploding out to whatever biological driver they have behind assembling a large genome. So uh, you're going to hear over the next few talks and then myself near at the end, what have we done to enable this and what kind of barriers have we tried to remove to make uh, this process uh, as simple as possible. One of them is more streamlined and efficient server to server uh, data transfer between the BPA data portal on the top left and Galaxy Australia on the top right. Uh, so that data doesn't have to be brought down to your own computer and then pushed back up. Uh, Galaxy Australia is very happy and proud to uh, put on more tools, workflows, and behind the scenes and visible to many of the researchers, an increased level of infrastructure to support these large genome assemblies. And that really is allowing us to do maybe what is the, in the pinnacle of genome assembly, which is, is non-hypothesis-driven de novo assemblies 
and all the associated post-assembly QC. What we've also done is build uh, how-to guides, and these are built, uh, I think, quite fantastically as a community effort um, to refine the best process to generate a great assembly. And um, because this is a circular process, we also will end an end-to-end -end process. We want to talk about the other options beyond Galaxy, and it would be very remiss of me not to mention one of the other flagships of the BioCommons, which is the uh, web Apollo service or Apollo portal at apolloportalgenome.edu.au, which shown down the bottom right hand corner there shows uh, the various levels of evidence you can load into a genic model to help you decide how well your genome has been annotated and to refine those annotations. With that short intro, um, I will pass over to the next speaker. Thank you, Nigel. Thanks, Gareth. Over to you, Anna. Thank you. Um, so I'll be talking about how we've been assembling genomes in Galaxy Australia and some of the detail behind that. So as we know, there are lots of current genome assembly projects going on, both in Australia, but also internationally. Yesterday, for example, we heard about the tea tree genome and we'll hear shortly about the Regent Honey Eater genome. So these genome assembly projects, they need a lot of computational resources and it's often difficult for researchers to know where to start. And they may have these common questions such as, where can I even analyze my data and what sort of tools can I use? And how would I string those tools together into a workflow that can answer my research questions? So a good option for running these analyses is the Galaxy Bioinformatics platform. So in the past, uh, and for many years now, Galaxy has been assembling what we call small genomes, um, such as bacteria. Um, and it's been doing this successfully for quite a number of years. And these genomes are about a million base pairs, maybe 5 million base pairs in size. But compared to bacteria, plants and animals have much larger genomes usually. They're typically around 1 billion base pairs, sometimes even larger. So with data of this size, it hasn't really been possible for Galaxy to run the tools that are needed to assemble these large genomes. But why is it so hard to assemble these genomes? It is certainly the size of the data and the, all the things that that requires, but there's a lot of other things going on that are sort of adding to this complexity. So one of the things is the actual biology of the genome. There are lots of parts of the genome that we call repeats. Some of these are um, almost identical regions that are repeated. Some of them are sort of similar areas that we also call repeats. Um, and even when we think of chromosomes themselves, these are usually in pairs, but sometimes even in higher copy number. So the, um, the strawberry, that's, that's an octoploid genome. So there are eight copies of every chromosome. So when we sequence a genome, we need to break it into these small fragments, and then the assembly tool will try and join these fragments back together to recreate the genome. But the difficult of that, difficulty in that is that there are all these repeat regions for a start um, of different sort of scale and complexity. And there are also errors in the sequencing reads. Um, different technologies have different error rates, but the tool's trying to deal with that plus the repeats and then in addition to that, it's trying to, um, it needs to decide how it's going to reconstruct these genomes. Are they going to be um, exact copies of each of the chromosomes or will it be a mosaic of every chromosome pair and so on? So it does get very complex. So to make Galaxy ready to run these sorts of analyses, um, several things have been done recently. Uh, one of them is to connect cloud store so that large data sets can be easily imported. Another is to connect high memory nodes to run a lot of these tools with the large data sets. And another is to install a lot of the new assembly tools. Uh, and we've tested that um, on several genomes now. One of the first te tests was a, um, a plant genome, and that took about a day to assembly to assemble. Um, and obviously, this doesn't mean that the full assembly process takes one day. There are lots of other steps in genome assembly, both before and after that actual assembly run. But the fact that it's so quick, um, potentially, shows that 
if a researcher needs to rerun the analysis, which they usually will need to, even if it's just to compare different settings, it's a lot more feasible to rerun something that only takes a day compared to something that may take several months. So it's great to see this expanded uh, research infrastructure in the computational setting. We're also coupling that with a lot of written documentation, example workflows and explanations so that researchers can really get the most out of that infrastructure and run the analyses that they need to run. Uh, one of the things that goes with that is explaining um, the context around assembly and some of the potential challenges because we don't just want to sort of promise a, a one-click solution, a one-hour or one-day solution. Um, obviously, things are going to take a bit longer than that. We want to prepare people for um, the reality that their genome assembly is probably going to be partly fragmented. It may be incomplete in a few areas because even the human genome, with all the money and time that's been thrown at that, has only recently been... Um, able to assemble areas such as the centromeres and the telomeres. So we know um, assembling um, new species genomes is going to be quite difficult, but we want to give researchers the skills to be able to customise these workflows for their own data. So we've been developing a tutorial to explain the basic steps with these tools in Galaxy Australia. Um, this is a slide showing the, the main steps here. We've got um, preparing the reads, assembling them, polishing them, and assessing the quality. Uh, and this is a modular workflow. So um, ultimately we'll be adding more to this, particularly with new tools. So we wanna demonstrate how a researcher can easily swap parts of these workflows if they require different tools for their data. Um, and we show how these workflows are nested. So here in the top left, is um, the complete workflow in the tutorial that we're developing. In the blue box is just one of the steps. This is assembly polishing. And the details don't really matter, but I'm trying to show the nesting of the workflows. So then within that blue box, there are two further workflows that are nested in there. So hopefully this makes it fairly easy for a researcher to change small parts or big parts of workflow. And then we want to show how this workflow might fit into the broader landscape of um, research workflows in genome assembly. Um, and I thought it was interesting yesterday uh, when Frederick Coppins was talking about workflows as a sort of an entry point into all of this infrastructure, all of the tools, um, all of the computation. It's sort of the point where it all comes together. So this is, I think, a key point. We want researchers to be able to feel confident in rearranging these workflows to um, best answer their own research questions. So in this example, the dark blue are the steps in the genome tutorial. Um, so there's some basic tools in there. And the light blue are the steps in other assembly workflows, such as the vertebrate genome assembly workflows. So just trying to give that sense of all of these tools um, ideally will be interchangeable. And then we also want to um, keep some room for new things. Even if researchers haven't actually requested them yet, we want to be aware of particularly the new technology that's coming up that will mean um, new tools and possibly new um, computational infrastructure will need to be configured for the tools. So yeah, just like to thank everyone involved and in particular, the um, Galaxy Australia team. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. We'll be hearing from Jo Day now from Taronga Zoo, who'll be talking about how uh, she's applied some of those ideas to conservation of the region. Haneeda, over to you, Jo. Thank you, Nigel. I'm gonna give a quick overview of how we're incorporating this genomic data to help the critically endangered region Haneeda. Um, firstly, I'd like for you to keep in mind that while I have some background in population genetics, I'm really new to genomics and bioinformatics. So the work presented here is a collaborative effort with many people from Bioplatforms Australia, Galaxy Australia, Sydney University and the Threatened Species Initiative. Now the Region Honey Eater Recovery Program is only one of 18 Threatened Species Recovery Programs that Tronga participates in. 
Now, these programs often involve breeding, breeding animals in the zoo for release, like the one for Regent honey eaters, and they're all underpinned by scientific research and knowledge. Now, to give you a uh, background to the Regent honey eater, as I mentioned, it's critically endangered with less than 400 birds left in the wild. Their former range extended from Adelaide to Southern Queensland, but they've recently undergone rapid population decline and a range contraction due to a variety of threats, including habitat clearing, small population size, competition, and climate change. As you can see here in this map, their breeding sites are now limited to three areas, a small breeding population in Northern Victoria and two primary aggregations in the Blue Mountains and Northern Tablelands of New South Wales. While breeding is restricted to only three key areas, genetic evidence based on SNPs indicates the wild population is a single genetic management unit. Now that's good, but having said that, reciting data and the presence of regional song dialects suggests that long distance movements of regent honey eaters between these breeding sites are actually quite rare. It's also important to note that a recent population viability analysis was conducted, which predicts severe population reduction or extinction for regent honey eaters within 20 years if there is no further intervention. Now to address this, Tonga established a breeding recovery program for regent honey, honey eaters back in 1995. They do this to provide a level insurance against further declines in the wild population and to help supplement the wild population. The breeding program began um, with 10 founders with additional founders collected in 2019 to help maintain the genetic diversity. Breeding has been extremely successful with hundreds of animals being bred at Taronga um, and other zoos around the country. Currently, genetic diversity is maintained by minimizing kinship in the population. So they're trying not to breed related individuals with each other. But the problem is that the relatedness between the individuals is currently estimated from pedigree data, not genetics. And this can be problematic because we're assuming that the founding individuals were unrelated to each other, and this may not be the case. Nevertheless, over 300 regent honey eaters have been released into the wild since 2008, with the last release occurring just a couple of weeks ago where 58 individuals were released into the wild. Now this represents a huge proportion of the current wild population. Now the survival of the zebra birds um, seems to be great. Um, in 20 weeks post-release, the success is, is around 70%. Long term, this uh, survival rate is unknown. And while there is some evidence of animals breeding, um, the extent of their genetic contribution to the next generation is limited. In addition to establishing a captive breeding program, the National Recovery Plan for Regent Honey Eaters also advises to select individuals that are predicted to have the best opportunity to survive and reproduce in the wild. Now, a lot of research has been conducted at Taronga with factors such as breeding age, the age at time of release and exposure to the song of wild individuals being found to increase the breeding success and survival of regent honey eaters when they're released to the wild. So what is clearly missing from this research to date and why I became involved in this program is a lack of genetic data guiding management decisions. The particular questions that I'm interested in is to look at is assessing firstly um, inbreeding levels and also levels of both functional and non-functional genetic diversity in both the wild and the zoo bred populations. Secondly, to examine how genetic relatedness influences breeding success and the survival of region honey eaters. Thirdly, to quantify the breeding success and survival of zoo bred region honey eaters released to the wild to really measure the impact of the breed for release program on the long-term viability of the wild population. Fourthly, to assess temporal changes in genetic diversity and effective population size. And finally, to understand adaptation to captivity. And this is important because we may be unintentionally applying selective pressures in the zoo environment, which would then cause genetic shifts um, and in turn may lead to maladaptive um, traits for individuals when they are released to the wild. 
So as you can imagine, answering these key questions on inbreeding, genetic diversity, demogra demography and adaptation is critical for species facing imminent extinction. To facilitate these analyses, we needed to begin by creating a reference genome for this species. To do this, we collected samples from a single uh, regent honey eater that um, had died in the um, breeding program. With the help of the um, Carolyn Hogg's group at Sydney University, we extracted the DNA and sent it to AGRF um, for HIFI sequencing. We then have been working with the team at uh, Galaxy to, um, and the Friend Species Initiative to to import the data that's, that was held in the BioPlatforms portal to the Galaxy um, portal. Um, and the next step is to do the de novo assembly with HiFi SM. Now, I'm going to, I'm really thankful to Anna, Gareth and Sarah for explaining the method of genome sequencing and assembly in their talk. So I'm gonna jump straight into the results of the analysis that we've done so far. So the initial results are looking really good, as you can see here in the faster statistics. Um, the main stats highlighted in red show firstly that the N50 is over 1.9 megabytes and the number of contexts is only 2,344. We also found that the total length of the genome is just over 1.1 gigabytes. Now, based on the literature and the genome length of closely related species, these statistics are showing that we are on the right track, especially when we do the, um, the analysis looking at completeness and quality. Um, for example, the Bosco analysis sh is showing that we have, um, is estimating that we have 95% gene completeness. Now, I was asked to give an overview of the challenges I experienced um, during this, during, while using Galaxy's platform. Now, quite simply, given my lack of bioinformatics expertise and coding skills, I would not have been able to conduct this genome assembly, especially at the speed at, at which it was done in Galaxy. Um, with a user-friendly platform, the workflows and training provided by Gareth, Nigel and Johan, as well as the Galaxy's online training modules that I did, it turned out to be quite simply simple, especially to rerun these analyses with different parameters and settings and assess the different outcomes. It's also really exciting that the same workflow can be adapted and used to assemble the genomes of other threatened species in the future. Now, having said this, understanding what settings and parameters to choose for each step in the first place was quite difficult and is an ongoing challenge. I'm having ongoing discussions with a team at Galaxy and the Threat Species Initiative to collaboratively determine what parameters should be used to provide a genome assembly that is best suited to answer my research questions. Um, this is a point that Anna mentioned um, as well is that it's, it was really important for me to understand at the start that creating a complete and error-free genome is almost impossible um, and it's often not required, especially when you're talking about conservation management purposes. Um, and this was quite a challenge for me to accept um, given all the literature um, that I read that, that indicated otherwise that we really do need these error-free genomes. So the next steps is Firstly, to select the best genome assembly that we can get, um, annotate the genome using the transcriptome sequence data that we have obtained from three other Regent honey eaters. Um, and then with a reference genome, we can conduct genome-wide SNP analysis. And for this, we are conducting DD-RAD genotyping for over 500 captive and wild individuals to help answer these research questions. And it's also helped I hope that the reference genome will become an open access resource for further research, such as characterizations of genes associated with immunity, reproduction and adaptation. And I know I'm out of time, next slide please. Um, uh, just to summarize the main outcome, conservation outcomes of the reference genome and the SNPs, um, which you can see here. Um, going to leave it at that, as well as to acknowledge um, all the people that have been and organisations that have been in, involved in this program. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Really, really inspiring what's what's happening there. So fantastic to hear, hear about that. I'm going to pass to Sarah Richmond now, who's 
one of represents Bioplatforms Australia, who are one of the groups mentioned in the slide there by, by Joe, is going to talk about how, um, how Bioplatforms Australia is generating the sort of data that Joe's been using. Thanks, Nigel. So just as a by way of background, Bioplatforms Australia is a national provider of life science infrastructure in the fields of genomics, proteomics and metabolomics. And we do that through support to around 15 facilities across the country who offer both um, capital infrastructure, so sequencing machines, as well as skills and expertise um, and staff to assist in sequencing projects. Um, we also help to support the Australian Biocommons, as I'm sure we've all heard a lot about yesterday and will do today and tomorrow, uh, which is really about once, these, once the data exists on these machines, how can we support the, um, the next steps for that data process? At Bioplatforms, we then deploy this network that we've built into what we call national data projects um, or our framework initiative projects which is really about a strategic response to key national challenges across agriculture, human health and biodiversity and environment. And the whole idea behind these projects is to build large scale data resources that probably wouldn't be possible uh, on a project by project basis. So it's really about maximizing the use of this national research infrastructure, building capabilities to interact with that um, and in the process, deliver these foundational data resources. This diagram here shows a bit of a, an overview of the projects that we've supported to date. The dark blue ones are our human health initiatives, and I won't talk about those today. Um, the sort of green hexagons are our environment and biodiversity initiatives, and the beigey gold colored ones are our agriculture or primary industry programs. Um, and the whole idea behind these is to develop data assets, and those are things like reference genomes, which we're hearing a lot about in this session, um, to support research and industry outcomes. We do this through, it's called our framework program, and that's because we, we deploy a, what we call a framework. It's pretty um, flexible to, to each project, and it, and it does differ, but essentially, in a nutshell, these projects are truly collaborations and they require broad scale collaboration from a variety of stakeholders to make them successful. So generally we work with collections facilities and museums and herbariums, government departments, large scale national programs such as NESPs and the RDCs in the agriculture space. Uh, of course, academics and researchers and, and academic programs like centers of excellence. Um, peak bodies and also international groups who are doing very similar things to us so that we can learn from one another. And together we all work towards a given goal and developing a given data resource. And we do this through, I guess, three main streams. One is around developing um, protocols and guidelines for sample collection and storage and sequencing, metadata standards to ensure data is interoperable and useful in bioinformatics pipelines. Um, of course, developing the resource, which is that big blue box, and that can be genomics resources or proteomics, metabolomics. We partner with other NCRIS facilities to do phenomics in the ag space, and some of the projects are a combination of all of these. Um, and of course, a really important element to all of these projects is collaborative software and tool deployment. So making sure that we have infrastructure support that enables research groups to run fit for purpose workflows. So that is um, pipelines and workflows that are fit for the question that they're trying to answer. And of course, to ensure that those are transparent and repeatable, which is increasingly important when using these resources for decision-making, be that in biodiversity um, or in agriculture. Uh, all of the data from these programs end up in uh, the BioPlatforms data portal or an agreed, agreed alternative with the idea that it's made available openly uh, through open access Creative Commons licenses. They do have short embargo periods on them to allow the researchers who collaborate with us to um, get first publication rights and so on. Importantly, this database runs off standardised standardized file names and structures so that uh, data across different initiatives are all interoperable. 
And it's all backed by a very robust uh, metadata structure to ensure that these data assets are uh, useful long beyond kind of the original purpose of which they were derived. So broadly, our biodiversity programs are working on a strategic response to enable Australian researchers to better understand the diversity and evolution of life uh, for our native biodiversity, and therefore um, how we can better protect it and manage our sort of unique biodiversity and environments. Traditionally, these programs work mostly in the genomic space um, and less sort of the, the other omics. And most of the streams across these programs are in developing high quality reference genomes, um, undertaking population genetics, which Joe was just chatting about, um, phylogenomics and taxonomy structures. Uh, we also have a program called the Australian Microbiome around microbial genomics, um, both in terrestrial and marine environments, and of course, environmental DNA or DNA barcodes. We have five active programs. We've heard a bit about the Threatened Species Initiative. Some of the other ones are um, our Australian Amphibian and Reptile Genomics Program, Genomics for Australian Plants. Um, I mentioned the Australian microbiome, we've got one around native grasslands, and all of these projects, uh, although directed towards different themes and different domains, are all working towards a very similar outcome, uh, which is around creating genomic assets, be it reference genomes or population genetic tables, um, to help us better understand uh, the biology of Australia's native biodiversity. And there's a lot more of these projects to come in the future. So that's why programs like Galaxy are becoming increasingly important. I wanted to also quickly touch on our agriculture theme, which is very similar to the biodiversity one. It's around developing foundational omics resources to enhance the quality, quantity and sustainability of Australia's agriculture system. Um, it does all the things that the biodiversity programs do, but we find that in agriculture, they're working more towards pan genomes and multi-omics approaches. So broad scale molecular profiling, looking at genome to phenome relationships and protein and metabolite profiles and their interactions. And therefore the informatics um, pipelines are very different to that that we, we're seeing in the um, in the biodiversity space, but we're constantly looking for kind of where there's overlap and synergies across uh, these two otherwise disparate communities. We currently have three active programs in the agriculture food space, one of which the Plant Pathogen Initiative has a target list of assembling genomes or population genetic data or phylogenetics for over 100 plant pathogen species. So there's the, these programs are, are beginning to really scale and these informatics pipelines are, are going to be, be in high demand. So one of the opportunities that we've seen over the coming few years is that while we're developing these baseline or foundational national data assets and collections, we also have an opportunity to develop baseline informatics pipelines that can help ease some of the re more repetitive or well-known pipelines um, that researchers are working on. Uh, this is sort of my attempt to represent that story from end to end. And, and really across all of these programs, they follow this broad structure, which is where I say raw data because it, it raw means something different to everyone, but essentially data is delivered from the facilities in a, in a raw format. And we need tools and compute to turn, to help research communities turn that into secondary data products or assets. So an assembled genome as an example. We then also need another kind of stream of tools and compute to, to take that reference genome and apply it in different settings. Um, and there's different examples for those in agriculture and biodiversity, but the, the pipeline there is very, very similar. And so what we've been working on with Gareth's team and the BioCommons broadly is across all of these programs and across each of these two sort of elements and steps in the bioinformatics pipeline, where are the commonalities? What's unique to the questions that are being asked and therefore what tools and compute do we need that's unique? Where can national infrastructure services help with this? 
how do we prioritize these? And importantly, what are the core infrastructure resources that are needed? And how can we as infrastructure partners make sure that these are easily being the keyword there deployed so that researchers can get on with doing science? Which I think is a great segue uh, over to Gareth to talk a bit about how we've taken this pipeline for genome assembly for hi-fi data, raw hi-fi data as it comes from the facilities and turn that into uh, a nice, easily, uh, easy pipeline that researchers can interact with. Thanks. Awesome, thanks, Sarah. And um, that is a nice connection. I think we'll just go straight to you, Gareth. Thanks, Nigel. I almost thought you were out of a job then, Sarah had done such a great job. So uh, it's my opportunity to, to wrap up this part of the session by giving some of, I guess, the more intrinsic details of how we achieved the outcomes that Joe and Sarah and Anna put together so nicely. And what I wanted to focus on uh, was sometimes what's invisible to the researcher, and, and that's the, the thought, effort that we put into the infrastructure that supports Galaxy in the back end, and how we utilize the combination of tools and data to make the best use of that infrastructure. So with no small amount of pride, um, I wanna talk about some of our latest acquisitions, which are five high memory slash high versatility worker nodes deployed at the University of Melbourne and at QCIF that come with some really fast CPUs, huge amount of RAM and some really great IO local storage for, for rapid movement of data. The journey that this hardware enabled is described in two ways. One, the BioCommons link at the bottom there, so I encourage you to look at that, and two, about what I'm about to tell you. And this is uh, firstly, trying to think, uh, as Joe so ably put it, as the researcher, as the person motivated to analyze this data, where does your journey start? And often it does start at the BPA data portal with a series of files you can select and the first thing we are thinking about is how do we move those quickly to Galaxy? And in a slide or two, I'll show you that, but we have a, a solution for that. And that solution works across the data portal. So it is not conditional on any one of the, uh, the consortiums or initiatives that BPA is supporting. So inside Galaxy, and in this particular session, we haven't had a great deal of chance to dive into Galaxy. We've seen some screenshots, uh, not only Galaxy is a, a graphical user interface to all that compute, it's a wonderful workflow engine. And, and Anna touched on this, and I guess I'm actually really chuffed that Anna and I have shown different workflows, but one's key to subtleties to drive the same solution. In this case, this is a workflow uh, designed to process Pacific Biosciences' latest style of data, their high fidelity data or hi-fi data, through a tool called HiFi ASM. There's some pre-conditioning or pre-conversion of that data that's required shown on the left side and an awful lot of post-assembly QC and visualization, which has been Joe's challenge to, to absorb and understand what to do with. From our point of view, it's also an opportunity to send any one of these tools to a different infrastructure, optimized for that particular tool. And again, for the Slightly extra demands, again, hinted by Anna, that long read technology and larger genomes make on our computational infrastructure, not on the interface that you see in Galaxy, but on the, the machines that are supporting behind it. And so in this particular case, uh, we made use of these high memory, high versatility nodes to really see what could we get out of those machines to enable genome assembly. And so we've already seen these kinds of results. Um, I just want to talk about them in a different way. So one is the metrics on the left-hand side of the screen. Now, what can we actually tell from this genome? And I would be, Joe told this story well enough. On the right-hand side is as what known as a bandage image, which tries to give us a, a visual representation of those contigs or those long assemblies of sequence in the genome uh, in itself. Uh, its interpretability is, is multifold. What we're really looking at here are nice, long, separated contigs that have been mostly self-resolved, which is actually a great outcome for when it comes to the downstream kind of work that Joe and our colleagues and communities want to do about mapping 
an individual's genetic content through SNPs onto this reference genome. For me, what was really exciting about this result is that we were able to turn this around in two hours from raw data to assembled genome and metrics on these recent machines that were brought online. And I think for what this means for Galaxy, but really what it means for the user drives to, to the heart of when can I do my research? What am I waiting for in my research? Uh, we can't necessarily sit up, set up an environment where every tool is going to run super fast. But when it comes to something like the iterative process of building a genome, understanding the complexities of that genome, readjusting your settings to take into account highly repetitive regions or fragmented or high GC content, being able to offer to the researcher a really rapid turnaround time in their analysis means they can go through that iterative process while those changes are fresh in their mind. They can set them up and, and see the impacts of them their settings as quickly as possible. And I think this gives a really nice user experience and, and we hope proper outcomes for, uh, for those communities. And so really, we have built an end-to-end -end solution. It's very difficult to show on one screen here. I could have gone back to my circle diagram. So really what I want to emphasize is the beginning yeah, for us, I guess, selfishly in that solution and some of the end to that solution. So I hinted a few slides ago, uh, ease of data movement. So as a genome goes up and as the complexities of your data that is generated, in this case, long read data, not surprisingly, the file size goes up. And one of the things we don't wanna do is have to move that data unnecessarily. In specifics, we don't wanna move it down to your local compute, to your external hard drive, just to have to move it back to another online service. So one of the real, value adds, which is summarized in a single click button shown on the top of the screen there, access and copy download URL, is really about building that system where data can be moved from the researcher through AGRF into the data pool and into Galaxy uh, without really ever coming down to your local machine and making the resources that you have uh, in your lab or maybe in your work from home environment, the bottleneck for you doing your analysis. And we hope to see more improvements in this ease of data movement. And at the other end, so post Galaxy and post Apollo, well, what we want to do as Galaxy and as BioCommons is make these workflows available to others to use so that they can benefit from the work and the intellectual investment we and the TSI and the OZARC and all the other communities are putting in. And, and to that end, uh, these workflows of ours are starting to appear on Workflow Hub. Uh, they're well curated, well annotated, and I'm um, reliably informed in the last hour or so, uh, increasingly being accessed, viewed, and downloaded, which is a wonderful outcome that they're there, people can discover them, and now they can actually use them to do their own research. So with that, we certainly hope that Galaxy has enabled uh, an end-to-end -end solution with all those partners previously described um, to allow all our researchers in Australia to analyze large genomes. I think I'm ahead of time, Nigel, but I'll throw it back to you for a more relaxed summary. Thanks, thanks, Gareth, and thanks to all of the presenters. Uh, here's contact details for the presenters, should you wish to contact them about anything that's been discussed today. Um, I know we have got one question, so I'll, I'll read that out and I'll, I'll throw it open to the panel to see who would like to answer it. It's from David Skerritt Byrne, uh, who thanks you all for your talks and wonder if there's any bio, bioinformatical pipeline services to generate a proteome faster file from these genomes of interest, particularly endangered species, to enable more accurate uh, proteomic studies. Anyone want to tackle that? Um, I could start. <laughs> um, I think um, that would initially require probably a genome annotation. Someone else jump in if I'm not on the right track. But I think if you want to see what proteins are there, you'd want to annotate the genome first. Um, and yeah, there are tools to do that. Um, Nigel, were you going to add something? I saw your name pop up. Uh, no, no, oh, please no. keep yep. continuing. Yep. So that, that would probably be all I would say so far, but someone else may have more input into that, that answer. 
no, where we won't leave you hanging, Anna. I think you're absolutely right. Um, again, if we're going to put my Galaxy hat on, the end to end solution would be to turn this genome assembly into an annotated genome assembly, put it out to the community for review and refinement through something like the Apollo project. And then once that reaches a level of maturity, uh, yes, converting that uh, and all the known genic products from that assembly into a, a proteome faster file is, I'm not gonna say a trivial task, it is a task that Galaxy or, or Command Line would be able to handle fairly well. Um, that would be, I suspect, my preferred approach. The more blunt approach would be uh, a six frame translation of that genome assembly and uh, recognition of any open reading frames, but I, I feel like that's probably a little bit too blunt force uh, for the answer. Thanks, folks. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the panel, so I'm going to take Chair's prerogative and go back to a slide that uh, Sarah, you, you put up, which is this, this one here. Uh, and you, you mentioned that as well as creating the data and secondary products like reference genomes, uh, it's important to think about the applications that they're put to. And we heard about one today from, from Joe in terms of um, uh, endangered species. Um, you, you noted in the slide that, you know, you, uh, we're looking for things that are common. And, and, and unique. Um, and Gareth, my understanding is that that, that uh, assembly workflow that's been put together in support of the region honey eater has been used on other species. Is that accurate? Uh, yes, Nigel, thank you. Yes, so it has been used uh, as part of the Ozark initiative. It's been used by other members of the TSI community. Uh, more broadly, uh, we're using this workflow and other ones that Anna's working on and uh, local here have been working on to enable the vertebrate genome project, reanalysis of, of global uh, genomic data. So short answer, yes, but they've been reused. Do any of the panelists have comments on other things they're seeing reused? I mean, are, are the applications also different? That Are we possible to get commonality there? I don't know the answer to this, just always a good place to start. But I know that in the conversations we're having across, for instance, the plant pathogen omics program, which is just getting started where we're sequencing genomes uh, or creating reference genomes and doing pop gen and phylogenomics as well, um, that we're doing that across viruses, bacteria and fungi are kind of our, our original groups. And there's quite a lot of discussion around the different applications within even viruses and bacteria and fungi, and then how those relate to vertebrates like birds, what Joe just discussed, and amphibians and reptiles and so on. And I think one of the things that, that we'd be really interested to test and we have an opportunity to with these programs is particularly that first box of tools in compute, because I think they're different styles of tools and compute you're looking at in each of those boxes on the slide but that first one that is around assembly of of sort of the raw data as it comes from the facilities how does that differ if you've got hi-fi data for a virus versus a bird in terms of the tools you use how does that differ and how could galaxy help support almost a, a decision tree about what pipeline you might go down i have hi-fi data for this virus and I estimate the genome to be this large, you should go down this road and, and vice versa. It would still require expertise and, and knowledge from the researchers using it, but it would help with at least getting them on the right um, pathway before they kind of go down using different pipelines and tools and, and services. I don't know whether, Gareth, you've got a comment or thought on that, or Anna, I know you've had work with bacteria genomes and, and genomes in plants and things like that, and how those processes might differ if we just use HiFi data as an example. Yeah, I think that's a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a really good point. And even if that sort of thing could be um, discussed with researchers before they even choose their sequencing technology, I think that probably has an even bigger impact on um, the decisions they're going to make. So yeah, 
definitely good to look what's common and what what is more specific for different um, projects. That was a great session. I really thank you all for your presentations and telling a nice story there. Um, and I, there's a collective clap from the audience. And over to you, Christina.